This is 21st Century Reformation at 21stcr.org. So uh, our uh, session today is entitled uh, The Words of the New Covenant. The Words of the New Covenant. And uh, we uh, are beginning by saying what is that not? <laughs> what, what would not be the words of the New Covenant? And the answer is the words of the New Covenant is not Moses' law. Uh, in fact, we know that uh, very clearly. Uh, we learned in Jeremiah 31, God himself told his prophet Jeremiah, there's coming a day when I will establish a new covenant, a new arrangement with the people. But he said specifically what? Not according to that that I had with them when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. So it's not going to be like that. This is something entirely different. So it's very interesting. That's the reason I say it's kind of a trick question. How much of the law should we keep? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think that's the, the issue. We're not under that arrangement or that covenant. So uh, uh, I think uh, the scripture themselves make that clear. So let's think about that for a minute. The writer of Hebrews uh, picks that up from Jeremiah, and he talks about this whole question of the new arrangement that God has in Christ Jesus and the issue of its sufficiency. Is it really sufficient? You know, or, or do we need that plus some other things? Well, uh, the, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews, the eighth chapter and verse seven, for if, and this is the, the writer himself saying this, he says, for if the, that first covenant, and he's referring to the one that was made by God with the people when they did come out of Egypt. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. In other words, if there were no issues, no problems related to uh, the first one, then we would still have it. There would have been no need for another one. But then he quotes Jeremiah. That's very clever, I think. He, he's, he's saying, it's not about me now. It's look what God told his prophet Jeremiah. And then he quotes it. He said, for finding fault with him, he says, behold, days are coming, says the Lord. When I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Wow. New covenant, new arrangement. Verse 9, he, he gets this part in there that we were just talking about. So the writer of Hebrews quotes, Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I didn't care for them, says the Lord. Wow. Wow. Verse 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother saying, know the Lord, for all will know me from the least to the greatest of them. So we've got a new arrangement going on. Sounds better to me. Uh, what do you think? So far, the way it's being described, this is a better arrangement. Mm -hmm. Verse 12, For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. This really sounds good. Isaiah 53 in there again. Right? Then the last uh, verse I'm going to quote here, and uh, is the writer of Hebrews says this, When he said a new covenant, he said, He has made the first mm -hmm. Obsolete. Yes, that's, that's exactly right. Whatever is beginning uh, to be obsolete is growing old and is about to disappear. He says, you know, when Jeremiah, God said to Jeremiah, there will be a new covenant, by implication, that means that other one is becoming obsolete and going to uh, pass away. He says. So that's very interesting. These are the observations of our Bible. The observations of the writer of Hebrews. And again, I think they're wonderful observations. These things, I think, should be helpful to our friends who are out there who may at times even be struggling with some of these issues uh, or at the very least may be troubled by some of these matters. If you have a, a, a rabbi or some uh, person uh, talking with you and saying, oh, you're, you're believing in Christ, well, that's nice. Now, uh, let me tell you all about the law of Moses and how you need to start keeping Moses' law. Now, we've got a problem, don't we? 
this is really becomes uh, difficult, and that is the kind of issue that we're seeing in times. So, but all we, I think we'll have to do is say, well, for goodness sakes, the law, and do, did we not hear the law itself, the law and the prophets? When uh, the, the prophet Jeremiah said, there's coming a day, there's going to be a new arrangement, a new covenant, not according to the one that God made with them back there when he led them out of Egypt. Wow, which one was that? Oh, that was the one that he made through Moses, right? So, uh, so I think that's uh, very powerful. So uh, again, then, uh, as we, we look at that, the writer of Hebrews said in the 7th chapter, verse 19, just shortly before this, we, we commented about this earlier, but he said that the law made nothing perfect. It just could And again, the reasoning is there. Why would we have a second one if that one made everything perfect? But the writer of Hebrews says the law made nothing perfect. And he develops uh, that thought and how it was that it didn't make things perfect. It was a stand-in, I believe, until this new arrangement with God would come. And, uh, and, and, uh, and how, how wonderful that is. So again, uh, just pointing back to that wonderful verse in, uh, in Isaiah 53 and verse 11 that, uh, that Anthony has been talking about. But the knowledge of Messiah, the knowledge of Messiah, the servant, uh, will make many righteous. So uh, his death and his sacrifice will make many righteous. But, but this is a wonderful thing. It's more than just that. There's a message. There's teaching. There's instruction. There's knowledge, understanding. And that's what brings us uh, to our thought today. We've been talking about various aspects of this. But uh, we want to be uh, clear about that the new arrangement is, has words. <laughs> it has mm -hmm. terms. Mm -hmm. And these terms and, array, and, and, the, and the words of this covenant are made clear to us by Jesus. Jesus Christ. So, Everyone in here uh, would be familiar then with the, uh, the amazing uh, statement in Hebrews 1 and the opening of that, that first chapter where that, uh, the writer of Hebrews is saying, uh, God, after he spake long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, in a son. Wow. So isn't that a, a demonstration of, uh, uh, of comparison? God spoke to the fathers by the prophets, by those of long ago. But, but, you know, disjunction, this, look at this. But he's spoken to us. In these, in these days, he's spoken to us by some, someone of greater uh, significance. Somebody who carries greater weight with God than even those those wonderful men that went before. Here's uh, I was thinking about this uh, just a minute ago, but here's an example that might help our friends at times, and I think there's a, a legitimate example here, and that's the uh, the wonderful story where that uh, there is the vision on the Mount of Transfiguration, and you'll recall that Jesus uh, had gone to, uh, on the Mount took the three disciples with him. And, uh, and then in, in this vision, he is transformed, if you will, into a, a conversation with who? Two amazing great figures, right? One being Moses and the other one being Elijah. The, these amazing great figures, Moses, the, uh, the, the, the one through whom God uh, conveyed that first arrangement when they came out of Egypt. Uh, and then uh, Elijah, what greater prophet? My goodness, this is tremendous. But then remember what happened. Uh, Peter, great guy. Uh, he's, he's just, he's just, he's a wonderful fellow. He takes a bad rap, I think. You know, people say, hey, he, he denied the Lord there at the end and all that. I, I have said, well, you know, he was close enough to the situation to at least be, be put in that temptation to deny. The others were off in the hills. He, he, was, he was always trying. He was always uh, of, a, of a heart to do things. And of course, uh, he failed in that test. But, 
But Peter was a great guy. And, uh, but he, on this occasion, just became ecstatic. This is wonderful. Let's pitch tents. Let's pitch. We'll have the tent over here. He's, he's figuring this out. We're going to have, you know, a summit on the hill here, and it's just going to be a wonderful and amazing thing. So he, he's coming in and he's saying, let's pitch a tent. Let's pitch a tent for, uh, for uh, Elijah. Let's pitch a tent for Moses. Let's pitch a tent for you, Jesus. And we're just going to camp out here. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be wonderful. At that point, there is a, what, a cloud that overshadows them and that situation. And a voice that spoke from heaven saying, doesn't even bother to talk about the other two. Great, great though they were. But the voice says, this is my son that I love. And then what does he say? Hear him. Have we come to a new day or what? But look at that. I, I think there is a, uh, isn't there a, a, a very poignant example there in what happened on that mount? God is, is announcing this is a new day. You know, these men were great. God worked with them. He, he spoke to the fathers by those men uh, that uh, appeared in that vision. But now you hear him. You hear this son. And I think people are, are not aware, they're not realizing the, uh, how mighty this is in the mind and the sight of God, and it was to His people. So, uh, so I was thinking in that light, then, if we want to hear the law, then we've got to hear Jeremiah saying, there's going to be another one, not according to the one here. And, and then let's hear this by Moses. We've, we've touched on this before, of course, but... Moses is the one who, in Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter and verse 18, is announcing, God has shown him, shown Moses, uh, amazing things. God, and Moses is rehearsing what God told him to the people. And here's what it says. It says, I will raise up for them a prophet. Wow. Notice this, like you. How extraordinary. Moses was a prophet who, who dealt with God, presence to presence, wasn't he? I mean, and he's, Moses is this fellow that uh, was the purveyor, the giver of the law. He was the intercessor for the people. How mighty was all of that? Mm -hmm. When you say there's another one like him, that's, you've said something. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yet that's exactly what God told Moses. There's going to be another. I'm going to raise, and where's he coming from? Not from the cosmos. I'm going to raise him up from among the people, from among the brethren. And Moses is a man, incidentally. <laughs> yes, we, we, we're pretty sure and certain of that. But uh, given a chance, people might, uh, might try to convince us something different. I don't know. But anyway, he says, from this, I'm going to raise him up. I will put my words in his mouth, in the mouth of that one, who shall speak to them everything that I command him. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold him in hand. So have we come to a new time? Is, isn't this rather a, a mighty shifting of, of, the, of all the uh, circumstances of God's dealing with people? Wow. It, it seems to me that we have. So of course, Peter comes along here, and, and we can pick it up otherwise as well, but uh, the, uh, and he tells the people that about this that Moses had said, that God told him. And he says, who is this prophet then? According to Peter in Acts, uh, uh, in Acts uh, uh, 3, 22, 26. Obviously, it's Jesus. So that's a, that's a very powerful thing, isn't it? Yeah. I love it. So, uh, and Peter is not shy to mention that, that part about, if you don't hear him, by the way, God's going to require it. So it's not quite good enough to say, yes, but you know, I'm, I'm a descendant of Abraham. So, you know, even from uh, John the Baptist, another great prophet there, he was saying to them, don't say to yourselves, I'm a descendant of Abraham, therefore I can you know, be as I please or I can't possibly be wrong. That's not true. He said God could raise up, you know, children from these stones if, if that was, you know, if he needed to do it. So don't, don't think to yourselves that, because I'm a son of Abraham, I cannot err, I can't miss. If you don't hear this prophet, whether you're a son of Abraham or not, you're out in the outs. 
do you think not? That, that's, what, uh, that's what Moses is saying, and that's what uh, Peter is affirming for us, I think, in the New Testament. Well, anyway, let's think for a moment then. I will put my words in his mouth, God said. This is big. So big that he's telling Moses way back there that this is going to happen. And uh, so we come along then, and let's pick this up with Jesus and see what he himself has to say about it. In John, the seventh chapter, uh, and verses 16 and 17, Jesus is speaking to the people back there, and he says, Then Jesus answered, My teaching is mine. No. My teaching is Moses's. No. You know. Why, why would Christ even have to come and taught if Moses had declared it all back there? That doesn't make sense, does it? My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Anyone who resolves to do the will of God will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own. Doesn't that stand firm then with, I will put my words in his mouth and he will speak whatever I command him? Wow. So what Jesus is bringing is not just some new idea he had or something that uh, he thought would be nice. Uh, he's bringing God's Word, really, I think, the, the ultimate of God's Word is, is now coming to bear in Christ Jesus when He comes. And, uh, and this is what we're looking at. So say, someone might say, well, silly you, you know, we have the law, we have Moses, we have all of this back here, and I can bring out the law and show you. And I could picture that back there, as you would speak to the disciples of the Lord, uh, and uh, the people perhaps uh, that Paul uh, spoke with along the way, and they're saying things like, uh, well, uh, you know, show us your law. Well, actually it was, I think, uh, the Torah of Messiah was being written. And uh, so we, we don't want to ignore that fact. And I think uh, it, it was being written, and we now have that in the, our New Testament documents. But yet, still, th they were able to say, well, let me show you something. Our law was uh, this new covenant, this new arrangement, the arrangement with Messiah. We can read that out of the first covenant, that this was going to happen. What would you say? if you were a Jew in Paul's day and he, he read to you or the writer of Hebrews read to you about what Jeremiah said about we're going to bring a new one. There's going to be another one. And not according to that. It's not be like uh, The one that uh, Moses had said and we read that, that this was not even made with your fathers. This is made with all of you who have come out of Egypt who are alive here this day. So uh, I think that in that time, you begin saying, "Yeah, we, we have a law. Our law, our law is not Moses' law, though, and our teacher is not Moses. We have the ultimate. We have the Son of God, the one that God stopped our friend Peter in midstream and said, "You hear him. He's the one. You hear him, my son. Mm -hmm. So, and then in these last days, has spoken unto us by a son. So this is very powerful." In John 8, 28, Jesus puts it this way, I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. Wow. I did say, you know, it's one of the most uh, strange things I ever imagined, that Jesus is supposed to be the eternal Word of God, and yet somebody's got to teach him. I don't understand how that would work, uh, why that would be. The, uh, but just exactly what my Father has taught me, as it is, you are determined to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from who? That I heard from God. You know, Jesus does not, and you think about that, he doesn't time himself and say, I learned from Moses and Moses from this, you know. No, I've gotten it from God. Whoever is from God hears the words of God. The reason that you do not hear them is that you're not from God. So what is Jesus saying? The words that he's speaking. That is the words of God. And if you reject them, you're not of God. And he's saying that to who? He's saying to the Jewish folks, for goodness sake. Yeah. Wow. Not, not to Gentile folks or outsiders, but these, this he says to the Jewish folks. So we're all accountable for God, before God. 
And that includes the folks who are the physical descendants of Abraham. They can't just say, well, I'm a physical descendant of Abraham, so you can't do anything to me. Actually, you can't fool God. We have to walk uprightly before him and according to his word. Regard. So in John, the 12th chapter, verses 48 through 50, and I think this is very important. I've thought a lot about this particular uh, passage. Jesus says, the one who rejects me and does not receive my word has a judge. On the last day, the word that I have spoken will serve as judge. Now, that's powerful, I think. We're, we're not saying those of you who will be judged by the law of Moses. You're going to be judged by what? Very clearly. Yeah, unequivocally. You're going to be judged by the words that I have spoken. Does that mean that the words of Jesus are uh, utterly important to them? Yes. They are the words of the new arrangement. They're the words of the new covenant that God is making with Israel and with Judah and actually then to all mankind, right? Sure. He's going to be a light to the nations. Verses 49 and 50, For I have not spoken on my own, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment about what to say and what to speak. Isn't that Deuteronomy 18 on the money? Absolutely. He's going to speak exactly what I command him. When? And I know that his commandment, listen to this, his commandment is eternal life. Wow. When I speak, therefore, I speak just as the Father has told me. But let's think about this for a moment. We read where that Paul said if there could have been a law given that would have brought life, and he, of course he doesn't mean physical, normal human life, but he means kingdom life. He means life in the kingdom of God, aeonian life, life in the age to come. He said if that could happen, then, that, then righteousness would have been by the law, and by the way, Christ wouldn't need to have come then, would he? Because it would all have been resolved by the, the earlier issue, the, the law. But he's saying that there was not a law given that could bring that life. And Paul has gone on to explain that the promises and our hope of the kingdom are resting not in Moses and that that came 430 years after Abraham, but goes all the way back to the promise made to Abraham and to his seed, which Paul is going to say in Galatians, turns out to be Christ ultimately. So, wow. I think then uh, we're talking here about life and we're talking about kingdom life and as we mentioned the other day, that's something that the law of Moses did not propose to us. The law of Moses doesn't start out saying, Moses doesn't say, when he gave the Ten Commandments, go back and read them again sometime, read all of that sometime. He doesn't say, now if you do the things that I'm telling you here today, you're all going to be wonderfully ushered into the eternal kingdom of God, it's going to be great. Not a word of that is there really isn't. But when Jesus comes, it's another story. When God sets him forth, raises him up from among his brethren, and puts his words in his mouth, these words are about a different, a different set of issues, aren't they? We're not just talking about civil law or even just religious law as the law was for those who came out of Egypt. Now we're talking about the eternal arrangements that God is making related to his kingdom and those who will be a part of his kingdom program. And it's all about it. Then Jesus came, what was he doing? He was preaching the kingdom of God. As he came, he was declaring the kingdom of God. And he was declaring what? Well, things like repent in preparation for that. So this is, uh, this is very powerful then. Everything that Jesus said related to the kingdom and about life, this is the, uh, the, the new arrangement that he's declaring already, isn't he? We're getting ready for that. And will these arrangements that, God, that Jesus has laid out, will they continue on through into the kingdom of God and on? I think so. Forever. And Jesus Christ himself, you know, he, he's going to turn the kingdom to the Father, but we shouldn't think that means that he's going to now go over and, and set the rest of eternity out. That's not the case, is it? What did, uh, what did the angel tell Mary? He's going to do what? 
He's going, I'm going, to, I'm going to give him the throne of his father David and he will rule for how long? No end to it. Yeah, there's no end to his rule. Back to the Isaiah thing too. Yeah. There's no end to his rule. So this one who is our covenant, the one we said, we believe in him. And that means believing in his words and trusting in his word. But we believe in him. He is our covenant. He's our arrangement with God. But that will continue, I think, forever as king of the kingdom. He will be the one, uh, as God's vice regent, if you will, he is the one who will govern the people, not just for a while, but forever. And I think there's no end to that rule, no end to that. So, uh, so then we're keenly interested when Jesus starts talking, we're very interested in what he has to say. And as Gentiles, we're super interested, aren't we? We're tremendously interested. The other arrangement wasn't for us anyway, as we learned. Sure. Yeah. So we're super interested, and we want to know all about this kingdom, and we want to know, hey, isn't it great that we can participate in this through the seed, through Jesus Christ? And uh, the uh, and we're not even the biological descendants of Abraham. How isn't that exciting? This should have our attention, but shouldn't it? It's wonderful then. It's also quite threatening. That that's the standard by which we're going to be judged. Yeah. No excuses when that. And, you know, finally comes to, to our attention. So right, oh yes. Then to agree with the words of Jesus now, <laughs> that's right. judgment in the future. That's all preparatory, isn't it? I think. And so we're learning now, uh, as, uh, as Anthony's mentioned, uh, we're in preparation, if you will, for that coming kingdom. We're, we are in training, if you will. And we're learning how we ought to conduct ourselves. So all of this business that we find in the New Testament, uh, over and over again, Paul is writing to the churches and Peter's writing to the people and so on, all of that. And they're not writing about, now you must keep Moses' law and you be careful. No, look, take another look. They're writing about, hey, we should conduct ourselves worthy of this that we've been called to as worthy citizens of the coming kingdom. Yeah. Because what is it that God, He wants to populate that kingdom with people who, what? Are, are, are walking uprightly, right? seeking to at the very least. Well, so we're keenly interested then in what Jesus has to say and interested in the things he has to say about the kingdom. And we're keenly interested, this is one of the reasons I'm keenly interested about some of these terms that we find repeatedly in the, in the New Testament about believing in Jesus, but also about repentance and baptism in water because it seems to me that over and over again that's, those issues are connected to Jesus's and, and John's earlier, but to Jesus's issues about let's, we're going to come into this kingdom. But right on the very front end, we've got repentance and we've got baptism in water that Jesus himself is, is uh, promoting at that point, but bringing forward to the people. So anything that Jesus is speaking to us is concerned to us, I think. And when he starts talking about the coming kingdom and, and the, the circumstances or conditions by which we will enter into that kingdom, you better believe it. We're, we're terribly interested, aren't we? We're very interested. Mm -hmm. We want to walk in, in that and accordingly. So in John, the sixth chapter, verse 68, we have this. Simon Peter answered him. You remember the instance in John 6. It's amazing uh, teaching of Jesus and and he came toward the end of that and a lot of the people walked and went away and didn't continue with him, right? They, they, just, they, just, they just couldn't go along with what he was saying. Involved him too much. But Simon Peter spoke up and he said, Lord, because Jesus had said, looking to his disciples, now this is, this is our Lord. Now I think this is If I had been him, I think, and all those people went away after he taught his heart and he's been teaching them all these wonderful things, and a bunch of them go away. We don't want no more to do with this guy. He's crazy. <laughs> Jesus then looks at his disciples. And at that point, I probably would have been drawn into saying, fellas, y'all aren't going to leave, are you? <laughs> It'll be just, I'll just be by myself. Come on now, you guys. Y'all are going to hang with me, aren't you? He doesn't. But he does turn to them and he says, are you going to go also? But I sense in what he's saying, he's where he's at. He knows what he's saying. He knows it's the word of God. He's not moving from that from that place in, in the words of God. And 
it had to have brought him great pleasure when his, in this case, Peter again, says, uh, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Actually, King, you have the words. Isn't that nice? I like that. But think about what's being said here, too. Why didn't everybody who believed in the law of Moses have the words? They didn't, did they? What Jesus was bringing was radically different and new from what the people had been uh, accustomed to. Sure. <clears throat> was the law against the promises of God? Paul says, God forbid. No, not at all. But on the other hand, it, was, it didn't really bring the promises of God either. Jesus Christ coming did that. And the words of our arrangement with God, the words of our new covenant, are the words of Messiah. We, we hang on that, right? Well, this, is, this is what it's all about for us. You know, we've had uh, uh, Anthony talking about, you know, what would Jesus say? Well, how about we begin to investigate what he did say, and we recognize that, that in that we find our covenant with God. I, I, you know, wonderful, exciting things going on back there. We won't read it right now, but how many of you are familiar there with the, uh, the terms in Hebrews where the writer of Hebrews talks about how amazing and exciting the giving of the first covenant was. It was tremendous. Lightning and flashing and people, you know, in fear and all. It was just awesome. And what does the writer of Hebrews say? We've come to something greater than that. Doesn't he? Think about what he says in that passage. We've come to something more phenomenal than that. And then you read what he says about it. What we've come to. We've come to. This powerful, amazing, new arrangement, new covenant in God. So, what are we talking about? We're talking about not just... Uh, everything has been so... Uh, uh, except in perhaps more so than ever in our modern Christianity, modern evangelical world, but we've watered down everything so much that uh, there's hardly any sustenance in, in what we're getting. The, uh, but I think that we have to realize that we have a message given to the people by Jesus Christ, and it wasn't just a lot of nice words. It was words of life. It was the words of the kingdom. It was words of kingdom life. It was words about preparation for going into that kingdom. Jesus Christ leads His people into the kingdom of God. And that's what I think that's all about. And that's why we're here. So, uh, and what is it all? It's all the commandments of God given to Him. God spoke to the fathers by the prophets, and that was great. But, in these days, He has spoken to us by His Son, this is really good. In those few words, the writer of Hebrews has already contrasted that this son is greater than all the old prophets, wasn't he? And then he goes on to say, oh, by the way, he's greater than angels, too. He's greater than all. So uh, that's, this is wonderful. So in John 14 and verse 15, we'll, we'll look at just a few of these things that Jesus said in this uh, kind of long uh, paragraph in item 8. But Jesus said things like this. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Ha! Huh. Well, it's interesting that I see this sometimes transposed in people's minds. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and my commandments are Moses' commandments. That's not quite right, is it? Jesus has come to declare a whole new scheme of things in the name of his God. And so he said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. If it was just a matter of loving God and keeping Moses' commandments. He could have just said that. That's not what he said. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So in John 13 and 34, Jesus says this. This is pretty powerful. He says, a new commandment I give to you. Wow. Not an old one. Not something else. A new one. And that's this, that you should love one another even as I have loved you. I think all that kind of works together. You love one another in the same manner that I have loved you. How much did he love them? He loved them enough to lay down his life for them. Isn't that the theme that uh, John picks up on in 1 John, 2 John? This loving your brother. 
like Christ has loved us. And without, without loving our brother, we can't say we love God. And that's what we want. So, but isn't Jesus then laying out the arrangements of this, this new covenant with God? Sure he is. Galatians 6 and verse 2, Paul says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Wow. And then in Galatians 5.14, Paul says this, For the whole law, the entire law, everything you want to say, if everything the law was trying to tell us or show us, the whole law is fulfilled in one word, one, one thought. In the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is what Jesus is bringing to us. The significance of that. What's, what is this that will stand forever? It's not about the, the details of what God told Moses to give to the people when they came out of Egypt. I'm sorry, that was wonderful, it was exciting, but that's not enough. What's going to reign through the kingdom of God is these provisions. You can almost get away with the provisions of the law of Moses. You just about hate your neighbor as long as you didn't kill him. <laughs> you didn't have to really love him, really. I mean, that was kind of a, a side point along the way there. But, but with Jesus, it's the whole point, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You love one another like I have loved you. Wow. That's a new arrangement that can stand forever, can't it? Yeah, and a, an arrangement that pleases God. I have said that I think in many ways, interestingly enough, I think under the law, God sort of came down to work with men at their level in some way. So, uh, and, and, uh, and that was wonderful, but God kind of reached to us to work with us. But in Jesus Christ, His Son, and under this new provision, God's calling us up to Him. Come on, guys, let's get with the program now. You're going to go into this kingdom forever? Let's get, let's get this, let's learn what God really desires. And isn't this whole business then in, uh, in Jesus in uh, Matthew 5 and 6 and 7, isn't that all about Jesus? Just cutting through it all and saying, here's what this is all. You don't want to, you don't know what really pleases God? It's not that you, Jesus says, it's not that you would love your, your neighbor, your friend, or hate your enemy. No. You gotta hate. You gotta love your enemy. You gotta love your enemy. Isn't that powerful? That's mine. But that's also us being brought up to by our new mediator, this new and better arrangement, this new coming, being brought up to what God really wants. His love. So he said then in uh, verse eighteen of Galatians five, Paul said this. But if you are led by the Spirit, okay, and I think that is, uh, is uh, has been talking some too, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, being led by that, that, by that lead. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're under the law anyway. Wait a minute, no, wait a minute. What did he say? You are not under the law. Wow. So if we're led of the Spirit of God, you know, the law was made for all His people, for goodness sakes. Right? That's back to that that, that uh, Paul was saying, why did the law come in then? Well, what, what's the benefit? Because of transgressions. The law was brought. <clears throat> so then we have Jesus saying this, and uh, we might kind of bring our thoughts together in this way. Jesus said in John 17 and verse 8, praying to the Father, For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. I really like them. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it's all, it's much more than just about uh, that, uh, so he died and resurrected. That's, that's all part of this. Yeah. It's all great, uh, essential and greatly important. But it's words about the kingdom. It's words about the kingdom life. It's words about the lives that we should be living now here, trying to live the best of our ability to help God in preparation for that. Amen? Amen? Yes. 
And is this our new arrangement then? And is it good? Yes, it's good. Why would I want to go back to something that was made for a bunch of lawless people? <laughs> Why would I want to go to that when I have something here that God has called us to in His Son, Jesus Christ? So I wouldn't want to be some of these folks out, you know, who are out there who are maybe saying, Oh, for goodness sakes, let's, let's pitch a tent for Moses. <laughs> you know, unless it, I wouldn't want to be in that situation that have God speaking and saying, Whoa, wait a minute. This is my son. You hear him. And then the vision passes from him, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, Dan, yes, uh, please. a lot of folks get all disturbed and upset about uh, displaying the Ten Commandments here and there. Uh, my thinking is we'd be much better off to display the Beatitudes. Oh, I like that. Exactly. What a great idea. Exactly right. What an excellent idea. It's an excellent idea. Yeah. I like that. I mentioned this too, uh, uh, along that same thought. Uh, the, um, I've gone into so many Christian churches in my life, I'm sure all of you have in one way, time, or another. And uh, often you'll see the Ten Commandments displayed. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess. But I have yet to go into any of those churches and see the Shema display. Ah, mm, yeah. Jesus' statements about, because what is this? is the greatest one. This is greater. It's not even one of the ten, but it's greater than anything. It's the greatest of all. To know that the Lord our God is one Lord and who that Lord is, that's everything. And then you love Him with all your heart, mind, body, soul, strength, everything you've got. You love that Lord. You got to identify Him first. You know, make sure you're loving the right yeah. Lord here. <laughs> And, and the responsibility of teaching that was placed on the family, not on the church. Good point. Exactly. Yeah. Well said. Yes. Yeah. Right there in, in uh, Deuteronomy, yeah. that's, the, that's the case. Yeah. Six. I like it. Paul well, is very exercising. It's not an optional extra to stay away from Moses. Oh, You're yeah. losing your salvation. It's very serious business. You are losing your salvation. It really is. You mix Moses with the new country. Huge problem. Huge problem. Uh, at, uh, Paul is just vexed with the thought that you realize that when you say, oh yeah, we've got Christ and that's nice, but let's go get Moses too. It, it's a, he said, you're saying something against Christ at that point. He's not sufficient. It, it's mm -hmm. almost a rejection of what was accomplished at Calvary. Yes, yes you're exactly right. Yes. You're exactly right. Well, the, uh, our last thought, uh, the last scripture that I had, and I'll mention this uh, before we break, but in Matthew 20, 20, this one kind of had got by me for a few years and then I began to realize what he was saying there. But Jesus is saying to the disciples as he is uh, about to leave them and uh, to be taken up into heaven. And he, uh, but he says, you tell them. He's just told them what he told them in Matthew 20, 18, 19, now 20. The last thing he says to them, you tell them, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. So what is our marching orders? He, he doesn't say, now you go out there and you teach the law of Moses to the very best of your abilities and you make sure they keep all the, the three tithes and the, the this and the, the others. and the No, he says, you go out there and you teach them. You tell them and command them to obey everything, everything that I have commanded you. That's our word of our new covenant, isn't it? We should revel in that. <laughs> we should enjoy it. And when we open our New Testaments and begin to read the words of Paul and James and John and Peter and all these others, and we, we read these amazing things. And as we uh, read uh, these, these things, we should be rejoicing, saying these are the words, these are the terms of our arrangement with God, the terms of our covenant with God, brought to us by one even greater than Moses, this one, the Son of God. Can you say amen? amen. All right, let's, amen. let's stand up and we'll be dismissed. So I just enjoy these things. It seems, it's just wonderful.